Hello, my name is Min Jung Kim, and I'm the director and CEO of the New Britain Museum of American Art. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lectures, Striking, Creativity and Aging, presented by scholar Douglas Dreichpoon. This program, which explores how creativity accommodates aging, takes place in the context of our current exhibition, Helen Frankenthaler, Late Works, 1990 to 2003. Organized in collaboration with the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, this exhibition marks the, muse the first museum presentation dedicated to the late work of Helen Frankenthaler, who is recognized as one of the most innovative and influential artists of the 20th century. On behalf of the New Britain Museum of American Art, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation with special thanks to Douglas Streisbrun, Elizabeth Smith, who is the executive director, Clifford Ross, board chair, as well as the foundation's board of directors for their generous collaboration and in-kind support. Helen Frankenthaler Late Works 1990 to 2003 is part of the museum's 2020 20 plus women at the NBMAA initiative, celebrating the invaluable contribution of women to the arts. Sponsored by Stanley Black and Decker, with additional support provided by Bank of America. And now I am honored to introduce today's presenter. In addition to serving as the curator of the NBMAA Frankenthaler exhibition, Doug is the director of the Catalog Resume Project at the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation in New York City and chief curator emeritus at the Albright Knox Art Gallery. His writing has been published in numerous catalogs, magazines, and journals. Recent publications include Robert Mangold, Beyond the Line, Paintings and Projects, 2000 to 2008, The Long Curve, 150 Years of Visionary Collecting at the Albright Knox Art Gallery, Giving Up One's Mark, Helen Frankenthaler in the 1960s and 1970s, and Modern Sculpture, Artists in Their Own Words. He holds a PhD from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I encourage our audience members to submit any questions that you might have in the Zoom chat window throughout the program to be addressed at the end of the presentation. Thank you all very much for joining me and thank you, Doug, all yours now. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. I feel like we just met yesterday again. Um, this, uh, and as Min said, the, the chat box is open. So please, during the duration of the talk, um, write your messages out. We will be scrolling through. We'll, um, we'll pull out as many as we can. Uh, I'm expecting the talk to run for about 45 minutes. And then with Q&A, we, we've got a bit of a hard stop at about 2.15, so we'll, we'll keep it rolling. Um, I want to send out some thanks to uh, Grady O'Connor and Margaret Pinto, who helped me pull the PowerPoint together, uh, and the two Lisas, dynamic team at, uh, at the New Britain Museum for, um, for making all of it possible uh, in real time. So the subject, uh, still striking, creativity and aging is, uh, is of great interest to me and probably dovetails with my own life cycles. Um, uh, and it seems, you know, very germane to where I am and to my thinking. Uh, it dovetails, as you know, with an exhibition of Helen Frankenthaler's late work, but it from there opens up uh, rather enormously into uh, a topic that's enormously rich and enormously complicated. Um, artists are of all stripes, uh, be you a writer, a musician, poet, um, an architect, a visual artist, a sculptor, a painter, uh, anyone with ideas, with good ideas, and anyone who has persisted as an artist is my subject. Um, creativity doesn't stop. Uh, if it does, there are probably reasons for that, but, but I'm interested in those folks that have continued and continue to persist. The, the issues around how one persists and what it means to persist uh, are what make this topic so interesting. And there's an enormous amount of research to be done. Uh, I have just started and there's no better way than to go out into the field that is the world at large 
and talk to anybody over the age of say 65 who will talk to you who has been an artist. So that's what I've started to do and what I've tried to do. I've also done this enormous amount of reading as much as I can, various sources, some of which will come up in the talk. Um, there's a lot of scientific research too, and some of that is useful, some of it uh, is less useful because there are these kind of optics around aging. The title still striking is a gerund, right? Striking is an active. I wanted the title to, to denote and signify something that doesn't stop. And the idea of striking, um, while it feels a little bit on the violent side, if you look at it crea creatively, it's a process. Um, and, it's, and it's about folks who continue that process. So uh, Lisa, let's go to the first slide, please. We're gonna start here um, with Merce Cunningham, a dancer. And most of the talk is around visual artists, but there's no better place to start than with a dancer because the dancer is someone who we're talking about a mind body process complex. And as your body changes and your mind change, the question that comes up around creativity is how do you integrate those changes into your process? And how do you keep your process vital? So Merce Cunningham is one of those persons that he never stopped dancing. Um, and he choreographed for himself as he was aging. So what he did, and some of you may know about Merce Cunningham um, and his partner, John Cage. Merce, you know, essentially was trained uh, as a classical dancer, but, but continued to expand the parameters of what dance could be in time and space, uh, liberating dance in ways that it just hadn't been before um, out of Martha Graham and, and you know, in, in, into then his own orbit. So, I want you to look at this clip. It's an interesting clip and it's something that I harvested from the Cunningham Foundation. Um, it's the third night of a performance, the third iteration of performance that Merce did in Paris, 1992, November. Um, it's, the, it's interesting because when it, was, when it was recorded from the balcony um, and I was going through the research, it, the first two iterations, you can't see Merce well enough because the camera is on the balcony. It's, it's it, the Paris Opera um, and it's a very large proscenium space. But the third iteration, the camera person zooms in on Merce and it's rather brilliant. Um, his feet are shot. His, it's, it's hard for him to walk, but I want you to, to focus on his arms because the choreography principle is translated into a gestural attack. So let's, uh, let's take a look. It's about three minutes. And the music is by David Tudor. Merce is 73 at this moment.
Great. So a few more comments around this. Um, the space that Merce is on is an immensely large space. And what he's doing with it is almost um, contra dance in a way. Uh, I spoke with uh, a Merce Cunningham dancer, Gus Solomons Jr. And I also spoke with another uh, Meg uh, Halper. And Gus told me uh, that he thought that what Merce was doing with this kind of gestural choreography um, had a lot to do with pantomime. And I think he's probably right. Um, but the most fascinating thing about it is if you parse out the gestures, there's definitely some language uh, going on. And the more, and each time I look at it, I'm able to discern various gestures of gratitude, gestures of, you know, reeling back in time, gestures of, of, of embracing. Um, Gus said to me when I asked him, what's the toughest thing? Because Gus Solomons Jr. is now in his 80s, um, as, as Merce was um, at a certain point. And I said, what's the biggest challenge being, being a dancer in your 80s and still dancing? He said, I can't devour space the way I used to. And that is quite a poignant statement from a dancer. Uh, and what Merce was able to do was instead of devouring space, he conquered it in a different way. Uh, the optics around late work are interesting and initially folks uh, tend to dismiss it because they don't understand it. Um, when younger dancers saw Merce, they grabbed what they saw. And that's, the, that's where one's legacy persists in younger folks generally who don't come with biases and preconceptions. And we'll see that playing out um, in some of the, the work that we're looking at um, as we move forward. Next slide. Okay, I love this slide. Um, <laughs> the, the talk could, could have an alternate title which could read something like slow and steady wins the race. Um, the hare is an Aesop fable, you all know it, uh, the tortoise and the hare. They're both old, but you know what? They're still running the race. And so this is a great metaphor for my talk because it's really, it's about folks who decide, um, or maybe don't even decide, there isn't a choice insofar as how one approaches their creativity. They just persist and continue and find ways to integrate um, all of the issues around body and mind uh, to enable themselves to move forward. Um, this also raises some issues uh, around aging. So mm, I used to have an ARP slide, but I don't, I don't really want to use that, but only to mention ARP, A-A-R-P, American Association Ret Retired uh, Persons, as um, as a very, um, how to describe it. So, you know, I don't know how many of you, when you first got your ARP, who are over 50, when you first got your ARP notice, even looked at it. Um, I didn't, and I didn't for about 10 years. I still don't want to look at it, basically. So what does that tell us about aging in our culture? And ARP is set up to empower people who are retired to live the kind of lives they want to. There's over 38 million um, you know, members of ARP. Um, but what does it mean? And what does retirement mean? And the word retire uh, has to do with withdrawal, receding. Um, it's, it's all passive um, kind of notions of removal from a culture. So the idea that, that ARP is there to empower, I find very interesting, but, but how does that happen in a culture that um, tends to privilege uh, youth and tends to see creativity as, uh, as, the, um, as the privilege of youth? Uh, let's go to the next slide. The issues are, are vast and interesting and some of the best literature um, is philosophically based. Uh, this book by Simone de Beauvoir, who was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's partner, uh, is brilliant in its breadth and in its ability to handle the topic anthropologically, ethnographically. Um, she looks at how, um, 
how tribes of um, uh, gorillas handle aging. On the one hand, she looks at artists, Picasso, uh, Titian. The chapters vary uh, in their in their in their um, analysis of this. Um, subject. She was in her mid 60s when she wrote it, she's about 63. And I find that very interesting. I find it interesting too that this was the author, Simone de Beauvoir wrote The Second Sex. Um, and as we all know, it, it, that title it wasn't about having sex twice, right? It was about women as second class citizens. And so here is a philosopher, an existentialist philosopher, who deals with the human condition in real time, not in platonic time, but in, in real life you know, situations. It's like, how do you age in, in, as you move forward phenomenologically in real time? So I think what she's doing here in the coming of age is basically advocating for uh, the elderly, the way she advocated for women uh, and does it in a, in a very compelling way. Uh, Betty Friedan, um, who really read Simone de Beauvoir um, before she wrote The, Fe the Feminine Myst Mystique, also wrote a book called the, the Fountain of Age. And that's also a really, these are like biblical texts for me because they're, they're, there's so much in them and they look at it from so many points of view, culturally, socially, economically, politically. Uh, and there are all of those vectors to the subject. Next slide, please. So youth, um, we love youth. Um, youth is potential, youth is promise, youth is uh, a better world. Youth is, is what we depend on to move ourselves forward. The question around creativity vis-a-vis -vis youth is, is it only possible to have brilliant ideas when you're young? Are we hung up on this idea that Einstein's, for instance, uh, theory of relativity could only have been produced by uh, a physicist, mathematician in their early ages? It could be, and that could be, and it could be that certain disciplines like math and science have this window of vast opportunity that the younger you are, the, the better your mind functions around those, those principles that are your discipline. It's not true in the arts. And as we'll see, as one ages, one's ability um, to utilize what one has and to expand that, and even to, to break from it entirely, uh, are very present. There are two faces to you, two faces to aging. One face, and this is Betty Friedan's um, notion, one face of aging is uh, decrement, decline, which, is, which tends to be our cultural attitude towards it. That over 65, well, why don't you know, just walk off into the sunset and leave, leave us alone. Let culture get on, let youth get on. You know, you, you, you've done what you did. The other face is, is to empower aging because there's a lot there. And depending upon the individual, there's a lot more to be gained at each step as one ages. Next slide. So there's no better visual artist to begin with than Monet, although the, the, the voices of a couple of people I'm talking with Clifford Ross and I'm talking with uh, uh, with Ruth Fine, both of whom said to me, Doug, why would you start with Monet? It's, it's Titian, you know, go back to Titian, go back to Rembrandt. Um, all of this is true. I select Monet because Monet, um, when it comes to post-World War II art, um, has a very profound influence. And also when it comes to Frankenthaler, equally important influence. So I thought he was a good place to start. He has this remarkable career um, my good friend Paul Tucker, the Monet scholar, um, refreshed my memory around uh, late Monet. So from 1914 to 1926, he, he does the water lilies. And some of us have seen those, right? Uh, either at MoMA or uh, Orangerie in Paris. Um, 
they are a stunningly spectacular series of paintings that he did in his set from 74 until his death in his 80s he tackles these humongously large, heroic, 30 feet across, uh, mural size paintings in his studio in Giverny. Um, he has a commission from Clemenceau that he receives to honor France with these paintings upon his death. He works out the deal and it's all kind of done, but doing it, you know, 1914, he starts, he, you know, the catalyst, I mean, he begins having lost his wife and his son. And he's basically, he's painting out of his, basically out of his mind to create something that was completely different. And he had his own doubts. And this is where it gets really interesting. The artist doubts himself as an artist who's doing something so radically different would doubt. So Cezanne's doubt was Monet's doubt. Um, and it's not uncommon for artists to doubt the late work because it can be so radically different from what they've done. Um, but he did it. Next slide, please. And the results were, were, were unbelievably um, radical. So the interesting story in Vis-a-vis -vis Frankenthaler is that Ellen Frankenthaler and Clement Greenberg, her then partner, Greenberg being a preeminent American critic at the time, go to Paris in 1954. They go to the Angerie. Uh, they look at Monet. Up until this point, Greenberg really didn't quite get late Monet and really didn't, didn't really care a great deal about late Monet. But they go together, he and Frankenthaler. And I wish I had been a fly on the wall because we don't know what that conversation was, but they come out of that encounter with this work and, and suddenly he's turned around. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art buys Monet, a cycle of, of Nymphia, water lilies in 1955. Uh, in 1957, Greenberg writes a stunning review of late Monet, which completely turns around the notion of what he had thought it to be. Also artists, Frankenthaler included, Milton Resnick and um, Philip Guston also see Monet and are very, very influenced by what they see. So Monet's loose, almost gestural, atmospheric uh, nature, but bordering on abstraction, he had it allowed himself and his imagination to go in a direction that was far freer and far looser. And that was picked up. And this is, you know, again, where it gets super interesting, where, where your peers, your artistic peers, many of whom are younger, see it, get it immediately, internalize it, and then externalize it in their own way. Next slide. Um, Picasso. Um, made a series of self-portraits, frontal self-portraits, uh, a year before he died. And these are some of the most um, difficult, angular, anguished, but terribly interesting. So artists who persist can be incredibly prolific in their late years. Uh, but things happen, you know, and there isn't enough time to, to, to spend working out anatomy and anatomical drawing and doing things the way you used to do. So you end up doing things, um, you know, flying in a way. So there was something about the late portraits. Um, well, I mean, looking at it, Picasso always had this fascination with African art um, and, uh, and art that was, I'm getting a signal. Can everybody hear me? But no one can say yes or no. Uh, I'm hoping everything is okay. Um, the facial features are exaggerated, grotesque. Uh, one side of the face is disassembling, uh, angular cuts into the face. It's the eyes that captivate us. So the right eye seems fairly normal. The left eye, there's something very, very different cosmologic 
uh, he, he's in a different place with this eye. The frontal self-portrait is, is a very interesting part of art historical studies. So Francis O'Connor, the great art historian wrote uh, a piece on the, on the psychodynamics of the frontal self-portrait. And it's worth noting that here, and Picasso was one of the last persons he talks about in his essay, uh, artists will depict themselves, Rembrandt, beautiful example, Frida Kahlo, likewise, amazing example, uh, frontally at, at, at certain points in their life cycles, depending on how they feel about themselves and the world. So the frontal self-portrait is a direct confrontation with the self. It's not a three-quarter view. It's not a profile. It's basically confronting who you are, where you are, and when you are. So that this was done a year before his death was an incredibly courageous act. Next slide. This painting's in the Albright Knox, um, so I've come to, to know it very well. It's another late work uh, done in the 60s. Uh, and it's, I, I put it up because the, the, the reception, as I've mentioned, around the late work uh, tends to be, um, a lot of people don't quite understand it. Um, those people being, say, the critics and the folks who knew Picasso's earlier work. So those folks, they, they tend to bring the preconceptions around what they had seen and what they had always known to be true about the artist. Uh, and so when they see a picture like this by Picasso, th they were puzzled initially. Um, it's, it's abbreviated. It doesn't have the same drawing uh, attention to um, anatomical detail that Picasso brought to bear on his neoclassical drawings. I mean, the man could draw like an angel uh, and certainly knew how to draw, but there's not enough time. <laughs> so this wasn't, it was a question of getting it out. And when he got on a roll towards the end of his life, it, he was incredibly prolific. And so creativity knows no spatial temporal bounds when it gets right down to doing what has to be done before you exit. Um, the darks and the blacks are interesting to me and I could spend a lot of time with them, but I think death hovers around this in very um, subtle uh, and rather insidious ways. Next slide. Another Titan, uh, Matisse. And th there will be some women in the slide presentation and I apologize for what seems to be a rather lopsided one dimensional look. Um, but uh, Matisse, likewise Picasso, two Titans of modern art. Uh, Matisse in late age found it more difficult to, to paint with a brush. And so what did he do? He picked up colored paper and he used a scissor. And the jazz portfolio is one of the most fluid, um, simple, uh, eloquent portfolios that, that he produced. Uh, it's just stunningly um, straightforward. Um, the use, you know, Bar blocks or bars of color, these two figures. And I would like you just to remember those two figures when we come to look at Frankenthaler's uh, solar imp, um, because the freedom with which uh, Matisse approaches the figure, uh, it, it's, it's certainly, it's not about, um, you know, replicating or verisimilitude. It's, it's really about um, seizing a figure spontaneously. Next slide, please. Louise Bourgeois. So uh, this slide was taken in 1982 by Robert Maplethorpe, the great photographer. She's carrying a um, fillette, which uh, translated from the French is a uh, young girl, but it certainly doesn't look like a young girl. Uh, and its phallic implications are uh, unavoidable. 1982 was the year that she had her full dress retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art that uh, Deborah Y organized. Really, really great show. Uh, people knew about Bourgeois' work. She was married to the, to the art historian um, Robert Goldwater. She was on the scene. She was at artist panels, but she hadn't been honored until she was in her 70s. And in 1982, 
she receives this this show at which point everybody is is in awe given what she's done um i want you to note the two you know at the base the two orbs that become uh you know almost the genitalia of this piece let's go to the next slide the two orbs reappear <clears throat> they reappear in a, in a in a piece that is um stone um, and their eyes it's called nature study uh, it's a later piece and she's carving and if you're a sculptor and carving is your metier and stone is your material that's um it's pretty it's pretty formidable so what happens as you age and you're not able to do that um you know, you have to make adjustments and you have to find a new material just as uh, Matisse did with the paper cutouts. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And so what she did was she, she transitioned to fabric. And this is just one example. And it's a great example. It's a piece that I acquired for the Albright Knox um, shortly after I arrived there in the late 90s. Uh, it's a difficult piece. And she was doing these couple pieces uh, where she would stuff fabric um, and lie them on top of each other, hang them in real space. Uh, initially, this would have been on the floor, but she opted to put it in a vitrine. And I think that that's very interesting that she would do that because uh, suddenly it becomes more of a scientific specimen uh, its space is not our space, uh, even though sculpture is phenomenologically in our space. Um, the prosthetic brace uh, introduces a dysfunctional element to a couple that's embracing. Uh, when I brought the piece to, to the acquisitions committee, um, there was... Uh, a woman uh, who I adored, who was older, uh, who had been an ex, uh, she had been in the Navy as a youth. And she said, she said, Doug, she said, what about the children? Uh, and she said that because there's genitalia in the work and depending upon the angle. Uh, and bourgeois was very, this, I mean, this was so much a part of bourgeois um, and the yin and the yang of things. Um, you know, this Janus-like, dual-faced, you know, male, female, dark, light, all of the bipolar elements that make up the human condition came to bear on her work, which tended to address sexuality and dysfunction, uh, emotional and family, familial, um, very honestly. So that she would present to folks this way with a prosthetic on the leg uh, was in keeping completely with her artistic ethos. Um, but Peg said, you know, what about the children? And I said, I said, well, I'm a little less concerned about the children. I'm a little more concerned about the adults. I said, kids will look at something and laugh it off and pass. I think it's more about the adults. So we had this amazing conversation. We ended up acquiring the piece and it now is one of the primary bourgeois along with the one we saw before uh, in the collection. Uh, next slide. When we get to uh, Willem de Kooning, um, we, we get to a really interesting case study because as he aged, his mind started to dismantle and he probably had Alzheimer's uh, ultimately. And the story of his progression is both unsettling and astonishing. And it's told brilliantly um, by Robert Storr, um, who along with Gary Garls at SF MoMA um, did an exhibition of the late works and we'll see one after this uh, in the late 90s. De Kooning was still alive um, in the, you know, in 96 when the show went up, uh, he died the following year. But I wanted you to see what 
is considered a classic de Kooning. So he was in his 50s um, when he painted this. And it's a picture that even on a slide or as a slide, you realize it, it's just, there are multiple forces that come to bear on this picture. De Kooning could never finish, well, I shouldn't say never, but had a hard time finishing or calling a painting done. There were multiple sandings, erasures. Uh, he used a newspaper. So on the far left, I don't know if you can see it, but there's some newsprint, which is left over because what he would do is he would lay newsprint on the wet oil lift it off to keep the oil fresh but also he'd lift it off and it would give him another a different impression that he would then work with every time de Kooning came to the canvas day after day month after month it changed for him so the pathology of working this way and he's de Kooning is not the only artist where you see this happening edwin dickinson was another artist it would take him seven years to finish a painting so what is that? You know, I mean, every time you come to the painting, you're seeing it anew and differently. And so as in life, it's never, it's never finished. And so there are these great stories where, um, you know, Tom Hess, who was a good friend of de Kooning's, um, was the editor at Art News for many, many years in the 50s, 60s, I would say Bill, the Metropolitan wants to buy the painting. You gotta let it go. Uh, I guess so, I guess so. You know, Albright Knox wants, you know, Gordon Smith wants to buy the painting. You gotta let it go. Uh, but he would have continued and he would have continued. What happens in the later work, and let's go to the next slide. And I think you can see this immediately, is that it opens up and suddenly it breathes in a way um, that it's almost ethereal against the, the glacial white ground. And so the story is that in his, in his advanced years, and he had had a very difficult um, period with, uh, with alcohol abuse and was really unable to work for many years. But at the end of his life, and with the help of his, his, um, his wife, his former wife, Elaine de Kooning, herself an artist and an amazing critic and writer, she put together a system of, of assistance and in a studio that he was familiar with and set him up so that he could continue. And when he finally got into that space, found himself comfortable in that space, he got on a remarkable roll. And I won't go into the nuances of that because Rob Storer does that brilliantly in his essay. Um, but there were these periods of intense productivity and intense change. And the late work of de Kooning is not unlike the late work of Clifford Still, who also painted it in a very encrusted, um, palette-laden um, method that later on diffuses into these beautiful plumes of, of color and line. And so de Kooning brought everything that he had. And even as his memory dismantled, he had procedural memory or muscle memory. And he was able to get to the canvas and do what he always did, but to do it in a different way. You know? Next slide. Okay, so here we get to our subject at hand, Helen Frankenthaler. Um, and some of the slides you will have seen, but uh, I begin with this slide and most of my colleagues will tell you, Doug loves this slide. It, and, and I do, <laughs> I can't get away from this slide because as a cultural document and as a, as a sign, uh, in Rowan Bart's words, um, it's so 
chock full of meaning. So this is this is uh, Frankenthaler at the five spot, the jazz club off Bowery in the late 50s. It's taken by Burt Glynn, uh, who was a Magnum photographer. And she's she's with her back to us, looking at David Smith, the sculptor. Uh, to David's right is Frank O'Hara, the poet. Uh, to his right, uh, Larry Rivers, the painter, Grace Hardigan, uh, a neurologist, uh, a dancer, Anita Huffington, and an economist. And so here we have the most amazing encapsulation of a scene that represents um, multiple minds and disciplines which was Frankenthaler's world in her 20s. And I put it up now because I wanna talk about what it means to be young and what it means to be footloose and freewheeling and what it means to be an Upper East Side girl uh, downtown and living a bohemian life and what it means to capture and glean from your peers everything that you can and to, and to internalize that and take that with you. In 2000, Frankenthaler started a conversation with, with Ruth Fine. And it was supposed to be, uh, it was initially intended to be the be beginning of a memoir. We've got the transcripts, they're not to be published, but uh, for someone like me, it's gold to look at that. And part of the conversation that, that, that comes up is, um, the what what one how one feels later in life given that they've lived a full life they've done all their socializing they've gleaned what they can they've collaborated uh and then they feel confident enough to continue that quest without all of the societal and cultural input which isn't to say that collaborations and, and social interaction doesn't continue because in Frankenthaler's case, um, she made print editions that brought her into a studio where there were printmakers. And that was amazing for her because it, it got her out of, you know, I mean, part of, the, part of the challenge of aging is to keep yourself engaged you know, and to, and to interact with folks um, who, you know, will enable you to, to continue to do what you do. Uh, but here, um, you know, there's so, much, there's so much about this image in terms of the people that were her friends, in terms of the, the intermingling of minds uh, that I think is important to note uh, as, as the threads that, um, will become Frankenthaler's you know, artistic consciousness. Uh, the, the other interesting thing and something that I'm thinking about a lot is to be part of this scene was to be hip, right? Uh, you went to the five spot to listen to jazz. You, know, you could see Thelonious Monk. Uh, you could see David Amaranth's quartet for, for two week run. Uh, you could see Coltrane if you were lucky. Um, to not be part of the scene was to be square, right? And that notion of square and hip is just something that now I'm very much queued up on as, as uh, two tropes that um, would have been a part of Frank and Dollar's life early on. Okay, next slide. So I wanted you to see in terms of Frank and Dollar's process, just how intensive it was for her to make a painting. Um, she had early on seen Jackson Pollock, his studio that is in the Springs. She was well aware that he painted around his canvas and like, a, you know, a, a balletic choreographed dancer with great intention and technique. He knew exactly um, how to improvise and, and maintain a spontaneity that was both intentional and spontaneous, um, Frankenthaler grabbed that and ran with that and took it much further in her own way. 
it wasn't an easy process in terms of how the body interacts with materials and in terms, in terms of how one actually makes a painting this way. This is only a part of the process. And these are, this image is from a series of images that um, Ernst Haas took in 67 at Frankenthaler's studio. Uh, they're very filmic. They were shot from a still, uh, they're still photographs, but seen together, um, they're very narrative and very filmic in, in a super interesting way. And I keep going back to them to study them. Uh, Frankenthaler did enable people to film her painting, um, but it was on rare occasion. Uh, and the results, it's, it's interesting to see that process. And it will always be interesting with someone who paints the way that she did to be able to see it uh, filmically you know, in, in real time. Next slide. So this is, you know, from 67 to, to 91, many years later. And the variables have changed. She would continue to paint on the floor, but it, it got tougher. And so alternatives were necessary. And Maureen St. Ange, who was Helen's assistant at this point has given me a uh, great insight into, into the methods and procedures that were used at the studio. So tables would be, uh, would be brought in on wheels that could be uh, maneuvered in the studio. Um, plywood would be, would be laid on top and then paint, uh, paper would be then um, accessible. Large sheets of paper might re remain on the floor. Uh, and this is a period. So the late work is a combination of smaller works, but also larger works. Uh, paper tends to dominate the, um, the later work. Why? I mean, it's really good questions. Uh, Frankenthal herself would say that she got bored of the woof and the weave of the canvas uh, and that she, you know, had done it. Uh, but I think too, one might want to think about the ease with which working on paper, um, paper was uh, presented less of a formidable challenge. And if something didn't work out, you just threw it away. You know, there wasn't anything riding. Uh, Leon Golub once told me that too. He said, you know, he said, Doug, it's just paper. You know, if, if you lose the image or if it fails, you just toss it in the can. Um, so I think paper, enabled her to maintain a level of lightness and a level of touch um, and a level uh, of, of productivity where she didn't have to feel self-conscious about it. Uh, and in that way, it was liberating. The scene is here. So you see pastels, you see oil uh, or rather acrylic, you see smaller works on the wall behind her, some of which are in the show. This is a piece that is in the exhibition at New Britain, it's untitled. And it's really a super great image. Um, let's move forward and we'll talk about a few more images and then we'll, we'll go to our last slide. So uh, Solar Imp is in the show. Do you remember the two figures that I talked about uh, or asked you to, to consider in the Matisse cutout? Um, there are two figures in Frankenthaler's Solar Imp. The work in general has an iconography that I find terribly interesting and I think as you know, the more one studies it, the more one realizes that Frankenthaler was a form generator. Uh, and while some of the works are more atmospheric, other works are more calligraphic and the forms are very discernible and there is an iconography and there is a potential narrative. I say that with a caveat because Frankenthaler would be the first one to say, Doug, it's about ambiguity. It's not about naming it. This is abstraction. So it can be what it wants to be and what the viewer wants it to be. So having said that, I'm very interested that this was done a year after she remarried and she's feeling really good and she's in a very bright mind space. Um, what plays out on the paper, formally speaking. I mean, we can, we can dissect it formally, right? So there are these dyads of form, the two black forms, the two sponges, and they are sponges. So she's using at this period, anything that she can lay her hands on that's in the studio, sponges, squeegees, um, 
you know, even a windshield wiper. Um, she's, you know, mostly acrylic. Um, spraying, there's a lot of texture in this piece. Um, she was always someone who pressed the limits of materials. And that was a way to keep the work vital. And it was also a way to challenge herself uh, and, to, and to perhaps encourage a new kind of subject matter as well. Um, but always challenging herself. And, this, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a good mantra for, for aging, right? If you're gonna be vital, it's probably a good idea to challenge yourself. So there are these dyads of form. There's a heart-like form at the very top there are, there are these um, red bloodlines that connect the two dark forms from which two more uh, veins descend, ultimately, the, ultimately wrapping around the, the orb. So who is the solar imp is the question. Was it Frankenthaler? Was it somebody else? What does it mean to be a solar imp? Who is an imp? What is it, you know, an imp is someone who has great character. An imp is someone who um, is somewhat irreverent, uh, full of energy. Um, I couldn't think of a better word to describe Frankenthaler um, at the top of her game. The other interesting thing about this work is that the rectangular elements um, are from an earlier period. So late work will often recapitulate uh, elements from earlier work. Uh, and will use them in, in ways that renew their urgency. Uh, but formally speaking, the two rectangles do here what they did in, in the early 60s. They stabilize the image um, and they give it great stability so that the, the, the white center, which is the infinite center of the image, reads very clearly. Uh, there's a, a line at the base which you can see, I think, uh, which further stabilizes the image uh, and a little, a little tag coming off of that. Um, I don't know, my imagination runs to a window shade in a way. And, um, you know, as an art historian, we, you know, this, this, I, this notion of unveiling um, and that, you know, um, we're being shown something that's being unveiled, I, I, I think is an interesting approach to to the image. Next, next slide. Cassis. Um, the two squares are there. Um, what are their significance? We do know that they're together. We know they're intimate. We know that they're, uh, they lie on top of a horizontal ledge under which, underneath, uh, is a cloud of Cassis-like paint. Uh, Cassis is a liqueur. Some of us have probably had it. Cassis is also a mountain town, coastal town in the south of France. Um, there are lots of levels of meaning to this, uh, but for me, that is knowing uh, that she recently remarried and is incredibly happy and sitting on top of a cloud with her partner, uh, the work takes on another significance. Uh, but it's again, one read of many. Next slide. Just a few more examples and then we're going to open it for Q&A. Um, Southern exposure is a large sheet. So Frankenthaler maintains the heroic proportions of her work um, even as she ages. Uh, she enables herself to do things that would test the limits of geometry and, and I'm very interested in her relationship with geometry given that a lot of the work and as a form gener generator, forms tend to be more amorphic, uh, less delineated. Uh, there are lines, but even those lines are um, intuited lines. And so when you see, when you see a horizontal element um, and you see how it's handled, it's handled um, with subtlety and diffusion, and even at the top, the, what seems to be a band uh, diffuses off into the atmosphere. Uh, I find that diffusion rather interesting and, and, um, and profound uh, given this, this point. Uh, next slide. 
So this is um, this was one of three sheets that I saw at storage with Maureen and Cecilia and uh, Jesse sent to them, my project manager on the CR. And I opted for this sheet because it was the most simplistic. And uh, all three sheets were conceived in pastel. All three sheets had a horizon-like image or represented a horizon-like landscape image, but it's not. And what I am intrigued about is the simplicity of, of where she landed. Was this the last sheet? Well, maybe, um, but we don't know for sure. Um, but I would ask you to look at the very top of the, of the sheet and you'll see a, a, a blue line that um, violates the edge of the paper. And this is, this is very Frankenthaler. Um, it's a way to draw your eye up and out. It's a way to suggest that what's happening in the image continues beyond the image. It's a way to expand the image. In a nutshell, the, the image is the maximal implications of the minimal line. So as minimal as this is, uh, what it signifies and what it represents could be um, you know, enormously profound. So let's go to the next slide, which I think is our, oh yes, okay, great. So lest I forget, um, Frankenthaler did continue to paint and there are not paintings included in the New Britain venue. Paintings will be added to the last venue of the exhibition. It's so important to see these paintings. Um, and I could wax on forever about this, but I will just say a few things. There are these two forms, again, she calls this Janus and Janus is, you know, is, is, are the, the two faces of the, of, the, of the gods or the two faces of, of uh, the human condition. And you can see that any way you want to see it, um, but it's the dual nature of, of who we are and who we always have been, that she would bring it to bear again in, in some of the late paintings um, is super interesting. The ghosting is very interesting. It's hard to make out just how deep the space is in certain passages and how some of the, the layering of hue uh, is very dense and at the same time, incredibly airy and buoyant. So she's in top command of her, of her technique. Um, and still improvising uh, like an angel. So let's go to the last slide, which uh, I want to end where we began, which is with Merce Cunningham, because I think it's important when you exit as an artist to exit with your creativity intact. So let's, um, let's and this is a shorter clip of Merce. Let's look at that. I love that final that final sequence where he's he's drawing into himself and then pushing out before he leaves. Um, incredible human being. Uh, okay, so I I think we're we're ready for Q and A. Um, whenever the leases want to start. Thank you, Doug. That was just wonderful. Let's start with um, you mentioned Frankenthaler at the top of her game. When, in your opinion, was she at the top of her game? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't wanna, you know, in saying that she wasn't continuously at the top of her game would be, would be a, a bit of a slight, but I think it's safe to say, and I feel good about saying this, that the 70s 
were a point in time that her body and her mind were in the most powerful place that they could be. And she was painting works that were 30 feet across, you know, as large as, as, as the great Monet's, um, who was someone that she consistently and, you know, in her late work comes back to, um, you know, she, but, but I don't know. I, I, this would be a discussion that I would have with others who know the work, because I think we could probably kick it around a little bit and, and qualify it. Um, there's no easy answer, but I think if we're looking at, if we describe the top of one's game as um, when the body, the mind, uh, and the imagination are completely and utterly in sync, uh, that might help us, you know, with the question. Um, but it's full of nuances. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we have questions about materials. What was her paper source and did she have custom pieces made? Yeah, she did. Um, and, you know, Maureen is a really good source on this. Um, there were papers that came to her. Uh, Ken Tyler gave her paper, a kind of grass paper. There were, there were different grades and different um, textures of paper and paper that had more tooth and more, more texture to it. Uh, she did prefer a certain kind of paper and I can't tell you exactly what the brand name was. I'm not sure if it was Fabrico or, you know, but um, there was a paper that, you know, and that most of what's in the show would have been, you know, that, that grade and, and make of paper. Wonderful. A question about aging. Uh, many cultures worship and show great respect to their elders. Why do you think that Western culture seems so quick to dismiss older people? And do you think it's related to capitalism? Wow. Um, I do a little bit. Um, if you really, if, if you wanted to point at one foible, cultural foible, yeah, I would say that when money enters, it's very easy to um, ask your elders to recede and withdraw out of the workplace, but that's only one arena. So um, our culture is an interesting one. And I think the, the privileging of youth uh, gives us a certain aura of uh, inv invincibleness, right? Without necessarily recognizing that what elders bring to any equation is wisdom and insight and experience. And uh, I wish there were more of a way to understand that and a more of a way for AARP to, um, to bring that into focus because those are the conversations, you know, and they're, you know, there's, it's political, it's economic, it's social, uh, a lot of dimensions to aging and every culture will have a different take on it. Uh, I think if our elders were living with us too, that would make a big difference. This, this whole notion of nursing home and, and sequestering um, is not advantageous necessarily. Yeah. Okay, and we have time for one last question. You mentioned empowering aging. Do you believe that this is what Helen was achieving in her late work? Whether she would recognize it as that, definitely. Um, that's the way I see it. Uh, I also see it that if you are creative all your life, you can't stop and there's no reason to stop. And the challenge becomes one of um, how do you integrate age into your process without stymieing the process and enabling the process to continue to surprise you and everybody else who uh, experiences it. Thank you, Doug. We're going to bring Min back on for some last words. So thank you, Doug, so much for your incredibly fascinating presentation. I want to encourage everyone who's joined us today to remember to register online for tickets to visit Helen Frankenthaler Late Works 1990 to 2003 in person at the New Britain Museum of American Art. 
And please visit, please visit our website for additional forthcoming programs. Thank you again. We hope to see you at the New Britain Museum of American Art very soon.